He claimed to be the unique, only begotten, incarnate Son of God. And then look at the death he died. Did ever a man die like Jesus? They first took off his clothes. Then they took long leather thongs with steel pellets or lead pellets on the end and beat him across the back until he could hardly stand up. Then they put a crown of thorns on his brow and his face was bleeding. And they laughed at him and they spit on him and they mocked him. And with one snap of his finger, 72,000 angels had already drawn their swords ready to come to his rescue and wipe this planet out of existence in the universe. And Jesus said, no, to this end was I born. On the cross, he said, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then he dropped his head and said, it's finished. He sees you and you alone. And on that cross, Jesus had the capacity to think of you. And he loved you enough to stay on the cross. Was there ever such love as that? And when they went out to the tomb that morning, they heard the greatest news the world has ever known. He is not here. He is risen. And if you don't have the resurrection, you don't have any gospel. Jesus Christ is alive. He's alive. My Savior, my Redeemer. Come on, church. My Savior, Redeemer, lifted me from the mighty clay. Almighty, forever. I will never be the same because you came me from the
Father, thank you so very much for what it is that you did well over 2,000 years ago, Father. This is what our entire Christianity, our faith is built on, Father. The death and today, Easter Sunday, the resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord. And the church said, Amen. Amen. How are we all? I'm all right. I'm, I'm awesome. I uh, went home and uh, watched Passion of the Christ on Good Friday nights just to get that. Com- that's become a tradition. I'll do that. And you know you're getting older when you know parts are coming up and I've never done this before, but I went. <laughs> the bit where he gets some whipped and he's talking about exactly what Billy Graham was just talking about, the lead pellet whips. I knew that bit was coming and for the first time I went, oh, no, I can't watch this. It was just too much to, to have that comprehension of the suffering that he went to. We're going to have communion this morning because that's how we remember him, right? We remember him every day and what what it is we do. But welcome to Byford Baptist. Uh, The ushers are looking for spare chairs because people are still coming in, which is awesome. Who's overdone it on chocolate already? (laughs) Without the obvious culprits. I'm looking for adult, I'm looking for adult hands. Adult, ah, yeah, so there's small fingers pointing back, yeah. Just remember, when you, when you do that, there's one finger pointing that way, but there's three others pointing back, all right? There's three other fingers pointing back, you know, when you do that. All right, let's jump into In Christ Alone. Commands my destiny, 
No power of hell, no scheme of a man Can ever pluck me from his hand Till he returns or calls me home Here in the power of pride No power of hell, no power of hell No scheme of a man Can ever pluck me from his hand Till he returns or calls me home Here in the power of Christ I stand Take a seat. Uh, we're going to take our offering for our Sunday morning, for our Easter service. For those taking the offering, if you can then do that now, just while I quickly run through the announcements. Everyone, did, who doesn't get the weekly emails? Does anyone not get them? Olive doesn't get them. Do you have email? Olive? Martin. Martin, okay. All right. I'm not going to run through everything. Important thing, though, for this morning is to please put your phones on silent or turn them off, whatever. All right. Last thing you need is someone coming through and calling you while the message is being given or a prayer is being given. Um, I'm just going to run through a couple of the important ones. Uh, prayer is so important. Um, the Bible says it. We all know it's. We all know it's true. We all know the power of prayer. It's vitally important. Uh, that if you can, come along uh, early in the morning on a Sunday and uh, pray before church. Uh, they meet over in the homestead. Uh, pray for the team, pray for the church, pray for the volunteers. Pray for your friends and family, obviously. Um, men's breakfast. How many turned up yesterday? Who was? Brian, we there? Don was there? Was there a men's breakfast yesterday? There was? How many guys we got turning up? 10 or 11? Nice. Secret squirrel stuff that shall not be mentioned. All right. Uh, men get together, talk about all the woes and how they can fix it in the world because that's what men do. When women come to us and they just want to let off some steam, that's not how it works for us. You're standing there, you come, with, come to us with a problem, we automatically go into I've got to fix it mode. All right, and then when we come back with a solution, you're like, I don't want, to, I don't want a solution. That's, all right. So that's what we do on a, on a Saturday morning. Uh, yeah, there is. I know there's also uh, new bank details if you need to for donations and so forth. If you need any information at all, you're not sure what's going on, contact Rob Cross. I won't get him to put his hand up. Most of you pretty much know who he is. And if you don't, ask around. Come and see me or someone else. Um, all good. Right. Let's jump into a time of prayer because, like I said at the beginning, prayer is absolutely everything. And right now, the world is in a bit of a messy place, is it not? I haven't watched mainstream media for a very long time for, well, because I just don't want to hear about it. <laughs> that much doom and gloom that's going on in the world. I just want to find some happy stuff that's going on and know that I need to pray for what's going on. So let's bow our heads. Let's come together as we pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you very much that we have the freedom in this country right now to be able to stand on a street corner and yell out the name of Jesus Christ, if we so wish. Thank you for the freedom that we have to be able to get in our cars and or travel to work if we're fortunate enough to have work, Father. We thank you for the income that that provides and what it provides for us and our families. For those, Father, who are looking for work, and pray for those, Father, who are praying for work that you bring work their way, Father. Father, the world is in a pretty dark place right now. And we know as your word says, you shall return. And for us here, when we look at the doom and gloom that's going on, we can't help but fear is that what's going on? And we don't know, Father. You're going to come like a thief in the night. Father, there's so many out there who do not know you. Not just in our community, not just in our state, not just in this country, but, Father, right around the world. 
Father, we pray for every single soul and pray that the Christians around the world have the, the boldness and the courage. They give them the boldness. You give them the courage to go and open their mouths to those people who don't know you. For those that are searching, Father, may they find, may you bring the people along in their path so that the word can be explained to them. And, and may they search no more, Father. May their soul be filled to overflowing. Holy Spirit, pour your, pour your love, pour yourself upon us here right now this morning. Everyone out there, Father, who's searching. Father, we thank you that we can gather this morning and proclaim your name. Father, for our political leaders in this state, in this country, and around the world, Father, as there is a lot of political division, may you have the people brought into place or awaken the people who are in place to open their eyes and seek your face, to seek what it is that you want, Father. Lord, as we move through this morning's service, this is a very special service, this Easter service, Father, may we constantly be reminded of what it is that you suffered for us. Absolute horrendous, excruciating pain that you went through for every single one of us, for those who have been before us and for those that are coming. I have an unborn child, Father, not far away at all. And you knew that that child was coming. You knew that life was coming and you died for that life. What a sacrifice. Father, as we move towards communion and the message with Rihanna and communion and Joe on giving us this morning's message. Father, use them both as vessels to say your word so that we may hear what it is you want us to hear. To the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Prince of princes, we say amen. And the church said, amen. Why don't you stand with us as we move into singing some songs of worship to our Lord.
love like this The world has never known On the altar of our praise Let there be no higher name Jesus, Son of God You lay down your perfect life You are the Lifted higher, be lifted higher than know you've overcome. There may be louder than any other song. There is no power that can come against your love. The cross was enough. The cross was enough. The cross was enough.
rolls all of heaven how these breath till that stone was moved of good for the lamb had conquered death Amen. and the dead rose from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls for all you come to the father are restored and the church of Christ was born and the spirit then the flame now this gospel to the fold shall not kneel and shall not faint by his blood and in his name in his freedom i am free for the love of jesus christ who has resurrected me praise the father praise the son Praise the Father. Praise the Father. Praise the Son. Praise the Spirit. Three in one. God of glory, majesty. Praise forever to the King of kings. Heavenly Father, we say praise. Praise to the Father. Praise to the Son. Praise to the Spirit. Three in one. God of glory and majesty. Praise forever to the King of Kings. Amen. Take a seat. Brother Rian is going to come up and lead us in communion. Good morning, everyone. Can I ask the communion elders to come forward, please? When you receive the elements, just hold on to them, please, and we will take it as a church together. spoken about this in the past, but communion, the term sacrament, it's one of the sacraments what we as Christians celebrate. One of them is communion, the other one is baptism. Sacrament is from the Latin word sacramentum, which means a sacred oath. And by taking communion, we actually bind ourselves to Christ. And the elements is there to celebrate his death. And through his death, we receive the forgiveness of our sins. But more than that, communion is not only a celebration of Christ's death, it is also a celebration of his resurrection. Without the resurrection, Christ and our faith in him is not worth it. Paul writes extensively in 1 Corinthians 15 about the resurrection of Christ. Without the resurrection of Christ, the sacrifice Jesus made on the cross was not accepted by God. But because he rose, this morning we have that hope. And that's what the resurrection is all about. That our faith in Jesus Christ 
we have a living hope. Not only is our sins forgiven, but we are given life. We have a hope in this world. But this world is not our end. But that we will be with Christ. I want you this morning to just focus on uh, two verses basically from 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 and 4. Sorry, I cannot see with my glasses or without them. <laughs> For I delivered to you the first of all that which I received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He was seen by Cephas and by the Twelve, and after that He was seen by over 500 brethren at once. The, res the resurrection of Christ is our hope in this world, by now, you should have the elements with you. I'm going to read out of 1 Corinthians 11 from verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had taken and given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake of a bread together. Father, you have given us Jesus Christ. You have prepared his body which were broken for us before and on the cross for our sins. In the same manner, he also took of a cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's partake of it together. Father, the blood of Jesus Christ, we cleanse us from all our iniquity and sins. Thank you, Lord, for the sacrifice Jesus Christ made on our behalf, that we have a living hope in Jesus Christ. And I just want to leave you with this promise. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Amen. Hello. I'm going to do the Bible reading from John 20. Can I just say while we're gathering the cups that there will be no crash or junior church today, but if you do have a little one or even a primary child, anybody, there's activity sheets in the back with like crosswords or coloring in and clipboard. So please help yourself to them um, if that will help your kids focus. Um, I'm reading from John 20, verse 1 to 18, the empty tomb. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and, and to the other disciples whom Jesus loved and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he stopped, and he stopped stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloth lying there, yet he did not go in. 
Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who came to the tomb first, went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. But Mary stood outside the tomb, weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say, Teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. This is the word of God. Just make sure. Yep, perfect. Actually, if you could turn that down just a touch. Uh, Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm very glad you're here to join us on Resurrection Sunday, this Easter Sunday. Uh, My name is Joe. I'm the pastor here, and I'm very excited to share God's word for us. Um, The first thing I want to uh, say is you you may notice my title here is Spiritual Inattentional Blindness. And yes, that's a real word. I didn't make it up, inattentional. Uh, And I will, instead of explaining it to you this morning, actually, I thought better to demonstrate it than to explain it. So I have a little video for you guys, and then uh, we will get right into it, and it will all make sense. So if we can play that video. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? was actually an ad for cyclists awareness so you don't hit them on the road but this is an example of inattentional blindness how many of you guys saw the moonwalking bear no who haven't seen the video before if you haven't seen the video before you guys saw the moonwalking bear as they were doing it did you guys get the number of basketball passes no (laughs) right I love it this is this is what inattentional blindness is It's uh, missing the thing that is right in front of your eyes. It's right in your visual field because you are focused on something else, all right? You're too focused on one thing that you miss the thing that's right in front of your eyes. And uh, how did I come across this? Well, I must admit, my wife asked me to go get the peanut butter from the fridge or uh, from the cupboard. I went to the cupboard and I stared for minutes and I could not find the peanut butter. She's like, Joe, it's right there. It's not here. You know that you guys had this? Normally it's men, I understand. (laughs) Normally it's men. It's right there. And I was like, it's not here, honey. She literally comes up, opens the door. The door was open. She comes up instantly, instantly grabs it right there, right there. And uh, of course she was right. It was exactly where she said it was. It was right under my nose. Uh, But it's, it's, (laughs) 
It's incredible, isn't it? Are you with me? You know, how many, how many people have joined me on this? Yeah, yeah, I, not a lot of women. <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. It's okay, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna see that it happens to everybody at some point. Um, but isn't that funny? Isn't that funny how in, in those moments, our, our reality, our perception, is that it doesn't exist. There's no moonwalking bear because we're looking at basketball passes. There's no peanut butter because for some reason our brain is focused on something else and it refuses, us, refuses to let us see it. Uh, our reality is distorted, right? It feels real. It really felt like there was no, I thought she was crazy. Uh, and yet as soon as she came and showed me the peanut butter, whoa, there it was. Uh, and you see it clear as day. And why are we talking about that this morning? Well, maybe it's pretty obvious where we're going with this. Uh, but I think for a lot of us, when it comes to the spiritual matters, when it comes to what God is doing, what Jesus is doing in this world, it's so easy to be looking and seeing and, and have what he's doing right under our noses, right in front of us, and yet we are totally blind to what's going on. This morning we're here on Easter uh, to, to celebrate a resurrected Savior. And it should be joyful. And there should be celebration. And some of us do have that this morning. But I bet there are those of us this morning that aren't quite convinced. We're looking. And, and maybe you're here this morning and you're like, no, 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 I do want to see it. But I just can't. I just don't believe it. I just can't reconcile uh, that a, re a person could resurrect that a person could come to life and save the world. See, this is what's going on in our passage with Mary. We see this through the, the lens of Mary Magdalene in our passage. And in fact, there's going to be four instances, four instances where, where there is evidence that Jesus has indeed come back to life from the dead. Four signs, if you will. And yet each time they are missed. Would you look with me? Uh, well, the first one we're going to see uh, is the stone. The first sign that we'll see is the stone that was rolled away. It is the first sign that, hey, maybe Jesus is, in fact, alive. Look with me at John chapter 20, verse 1. It is going to be up here on the screen as well. John chapter 20, verse 1. If you have your Bible, I'll take a moment for you to get there. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been moved, removed from the entrance. The first thing we want to see here is that this is a story. This is, this is really happening. This is historical. That John is writing for us. And Mary, it's through the lens of Mary Magdalene. Now, Mary was somebody who Jesus had healed. She, he had healed her miraculously, and she had then followed Jesus from that point on. She had an encounter with Jesus. She followed Jesus. Every time you read the gospel, you will see that when Jesus died, Mary, Mary was there. She witnessed Jesus' death on the cross. A, a lot of the disciples, a lot of the disciples, not all of them, but a lot of them had abandoned Jesus. They weren't there. Mary was there. Mary was also there. When Jesus was laid in the tomb, she saw Jesus taken down from the cross. She saw Jesus being put inside the tomb. And Mary saw the stone be put in front of the tomb. Mary saw all of this. But there's one thing that we need to see that's going on in this verse. And maybe you missed it, right? Right here. Do you see, do you see these? It's in, in, in gold here. There's a little phrase, while it was still dark. See, when we read John's gospel, the word darkness is a theme. Every time you see darkness, it is symbolic that something else is going on. There is somebody here who is in the dark. It's a good way to understand it. Uh, they're in the dark. They don't understand. They're not aware that other things are going on. We see this uh, uh, with Nicodemus. While it was still dark, Nicodemus, who was one of the, the religious rulers, came to Jesus because he was unaware. In, in John, from the beginning, uh, Jesus is a light. 
right? He's seen as a light because he wants to take people out of the darkness. He wants to shine into the darkness so they can be aware of what is previously dark. So when we see there's darkness in a passage, our brain has to go on to, ah, somebody doesn't realize something. And that, in fact, is Mary. See, even though Mary uh, is walking towards the tomb, she's, she's coming towards the tomb, she's not aware that Jesus is in fact risen, that she is alive. She has a little bit of spiritual inattentional blindness. And we'll see that this progresses. Why? Because in her reality, in her point of view, through her lens, makes sense, dead bodies don't rise. Any of you guys witness a dead person come to life? No. Dead, dead bodies don't just come back to life. And so she's coming to the tomb, expecting to find, focusing on a dead body. And so when she comes to the tomb, and she sees, you, you do see here, you'll see that she saw, there's a next one, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. She sees the stone removed, but instead of thinking, oh, this might be a sign that Jesus is alive, she does what I think most of us would assume, oh, something's wrong. And in fact, she believes what a lot of people assume about Jesus' resurrection is that the body was stolen. Uh, if you look here on the next verse, this is what she says. Verse 2. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the other disciple, the one who Jesus loved, that's John who wrote the gospel uh, that we're reading. She came to those both and said, here it is, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they've put him. We've taken, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. Logically, this, this makes sense for her to believe this. The body's not there, although she never really looked in. But the stone has moved away. And she panics and she runs back and she tells the disciples, no, it's missing. It's missing. He's missing. He's gone. And we have our first stance that mm, her focus is on a dead body. And so she goes and she tells them, and the story goes on, and we see the next sign, actually, uh, where there's a little bit more spiritual inattentional blindness. If this thing passes, I think it. And, and the second sign that we're going to see as we go on is that Jesus' burial linen cloths are there, but the body is not. Look with me at verse 3. The story goes on. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both are running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. That's a funny saying. Uh, I got to love a little bit of humor in the Bible. You know, there's John, and he's, he wrote this, and there's Peter, and they have a race because they care, and John makes sure to tell you that he beat Peter. All right. Thank you, John. But it's, <laughs> it's so good. But it's, another, it's just another example that these are real events, right? This isn't a story that's made up. The people were actually here. John actually beat Peter, and now the whole world will know. Verse 5, John bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in place, separate from the linen. See, I love this. Peter, Peter who had just three days earlier denied Christ abandoned Christ. Oh, he loved Christ. But when the push came to shove, he realized that he couldn't go the distance as he thought he would. He had abandoned Jesus in his, in his hour, and Jesus went to the cross without him. But this same Peter, the same Peter, you see his love. He comes hurtling, rushing into this tomb, jumps right in there in very Peter fashion. And did you see what he saw? He saw, verse 6, the strips of linen lying there as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. When they buried people, they wrapped cloths around them, right? Some for the body, one for the head. But notice this is another sign. This is another example, more proof that Jesus is risen. 
Because you might be thinking, well, maybe he was just stolen, as Mary is assuming. But here's the thing. If you were going to steal a body from a tomb, first of all, uh, the, the Jews didn't go and touch, touch dead bodies. They didn't go to the tombs because that would make them unclean. They, they stayed away from them. But secondly, uh, we found out from the other Gospels that a guard, was a Roman guard was actually posted in front of this tomb. So if you were going to come here and you somehow are going to knock out some Roman soldiers and you're somehow going to push away the tomb, you're not going to stick around and unwrap the body. You're going to snatch, grab, and get on out of there. Why, why would you take off the linen clothes, the linen cloths? And, and if you were going to take off the linen cloths, why would you wrap them back up exactly as they were where Jesus' body was? See, this isn't just ordinary pile of cloths lying there. Now, this is an incredible fact. The way it is described to us is as Jesus almost evaporated out of them, or like a butterfly bursting from a cocoon. Poof. He's just, there's the clothes, exactly, there's the cloths exactly where they lied him, but there's no body. They're still wrapped up. There's no body in the tomb. There's no body in the cloths. And even though, even though the other disciple, this is John, verse 8, even though he sees this and believes, we see in verse 9 that him and Peter still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. There is a belief, but it's still not complete. It's still, the, it's, the focus isn't still there. And we see this because both of them, when they leave, See, then the disciples went back to where they're staying. And we see that how they're staying where they are is in fear. They've locked themselves in a room because they are afraid that the religious leader are going to get them too. And maybe you're like, well, oh, I don't know. It's just a stone. It's just some cloth. Maybe. Maybe. Well, there's more proof. And it gets a little more incredible to this. And we still have the problem. Mary is still outside, still outside the tomb weeping. And you could say, well, maybe John, John believed. Yeah, but Mary still doesn't believe. She still sees those cloths, but she still is missing that Jesus is alive. Look with me at the next verse, and we'll see the, the third, sorry, the third proof here that the angels, there are angels in the tomb. Look at verse 11. I think we'll get there. And we'll get there. There. Nope. There it is. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. She's weeping. And as she wept, she bent over to look at the tomb, to look into the tomb. And notice what she saw. Every time, saw, saw, saw with her eyes, saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. And the angels asked her, woman, why are you crying? Why are you crying? Now, there's two ways you could read that. All right, you can understand this. Uh, the first and, and probably most easily way to understand this is you see somebody crying and you're curious. Eh, well, why are you crying? But remember in John's gospel, he's so good at double meanings. Just like the dark, he's so, he's so clever in writing double meanings into this. Uh, Mary, why are you crying? Because Jesus is risen. That's the implication. This is Resurrection Sunday. You're at a tomb that's empty. Why are you crying? Oh, it makes a lot of sense if his body's still there. But why are you crying when in reality you should be celebrating? Notice what her response is. It's the rest of verse 13. They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. Spiritual, inattentional blindness. She's come to see a dead body, so she's unable to see a risen Lord. 
or the evidences of a risen Savior. Do you see what's going on here? You're like, what? She's talking to angels. She's talking to angels. There's two of them right there. Oh, Joe, no, no, angels. No, 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 no. Those are, they could be just people or they could have looked like people. So she, maybe she didn't know that they were angels. Yes, maybe, maybe. That's the way we want to fit it into our reality. But here's the question. How did they get there? Why are they there? People don't just sit around in tombs. They don't do that. And she was there the whole time. How did they sneak in? Right? No, 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 no. See, these are, in fact, angels. But we, oftentimes, we want to just see what we think is our reality. And we'll try to fit what's going on. We'll try to make it fit, uh, make sense to what we are believing. What we believe. What we see as real. What we understand. So she sees the angel, she talks to the angels, and she misses the incredible thing. But there's more. The fourth sign we see here, Jesus himself. She actually sees Jesus himself. Look here at verse 14. At this Mary turned around and, do you guys see that word? Saw. She saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Isn't that incredible? She saw him standing there, but didn't realize it was him, Mary, who had been healed by him. Mary, who had fall, followed him. Mary, who had seen him on the cross. Mary, who had seen him put into the tomb, did not recognize her dear friend and master. Why? Well, verse 15, he asks, woman, why are you crying? There it is again. A little hint. Why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? I can only imagine Jesus said this with a little bit of a smirk on his face. Mary. Well, he doesn't say Mary yet. He says, hey, who, 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 who is it you're looking for? Who? who? Oh, okay. <laughs> but look at what she, look how she responds, right? She's still in her own reality. She's still focused on trying to make this make sense to her. Look at the rest of it. Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. She's still looking for a dead body. And you know what? She doesn't even answer his question. She, did you notice that? It, let's say this was a gardener. In her grief, she's so trapped and lost in despair in her own reality that she can't even answer his question right. Who is it that you're looking for? Oh, just tell me where he is. I'll go get him. Just tell me where you put If you moved him, I'll put him. She doesn't say his name. If that was a gardener, how would he ever know who she's talking about? She's just so lost. She's just so stuck in her own reality that she doesn't see Jesus right in front of her face. She cannot. Hear this, cannot accept that Jesus is alive, though he's right there under her nose. Spiritual, inattentional blindness. Maybe there are some of us today, right now, and we find ourselves in that position. Perhaps you do believe Jesus existed. You're not, you're not denying. You're not one of those people who just outright think it's garbage or a fairy tale or reject him outright. No, you believe Jesus existed. Maybe you come to church on Sundays. Maybe you just come on Easter. You hear and you've heard the gospel. Maybe you've looked in the, the, the Bible yourself. You've, you've read what Jesus has said. 
You, you listen to what people say about Jesus, who he was, who he is, and, and what he's done for us. You're there. You hear it. You read it. But you still cannot accept it. You still cannot believe because it doesn't make sense. Oh, you, you can see it. You, you, you know what it's saying, but it's not reconciled. You can't reconcile it to how you view the world. This doesn't make sense to your world view. It doesn't make sense. And so you want to believe, but you can't. Perhaps you're even here today, and like Mary, you feel trapped. You feel stuck. You feel, perhaps, pain or suffering, and you're looking for answers. Maybe guilt. Guilt is not reality. It can't happen that somebody would save or love me. Maybe you are stuck and lost in your own sorrow and in your own despair, just like Mary. But all the while, Jesus is right there. How do we get out of that? How do we see what we cannot see? That's the question, isn't it? How do I see a moonwalking bear? How do I find the peanut butter? It's the reality. See, the danger is that we read this and we think the answer is, well, I got to look harder. <sighs> I just have to look harder. The problem with that is, the, the problem with that is that it's just not going to happen. That's like saying, I'm going to find a moonwalking bear by staring harder at how many times the team in white passed the basketball. Right? If I just stared harder at the passes, I'm going to find the moonwalking bear. If I just stared hard enough at this cupboard, I just might find the peanut butter. The problem is if our focus is in the wrong place, no matter what we do, we're never, ever going to do it. In fact, how do you even find the peanut butter? How do you find the moonwalking bear? Somebody else needs to show you. Somebody else needs to show you. And that's easy with physical things. But how is Mary going to see Jesus? Stare at him harder? <laughs> no. See, this is, this is one of the, the most, it can be one of the most frustrating things about Christian faith. See, see, Christian faith is not the result of logical rationalization, of trying to fit Jesus and the things that he's doing and the things of the, spirit, the spiritual work of God. It's not trying to fit that into our worldview, into our reality. It's not what Christian faith is the result of. No, this is what it is. And I'll put it up here. Christian faith is the result of a reality-altering um, encounter with the risen Savior who calls your name. I'm going to read that out, and we're going to explain it in a second. Christian faith is the result of a reality-altering encounter with Jesus and the Jesus who will call your name to get you out of there. See, you can't keep your reality and expect to see Jesus, or expect to make sense of the Bible. Jesus needs to break into your reality and explode it and bring you into his reality. And this is what he does with Mary. Look at the next verse, if we get this going. All right, next verse, perfect. Jesus said to her, Mary, Mary. Mary, I don't know how he said it, but you know what it did. It brought her to life, 100%. She turned to him. We look at this next, this next line. Mary turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. And you might be thinking, teacher? <laughs> teacher? No, well, two things. Raboni here is first and foremost uh, a word in her heart language, in her heart, in her native tongue. 
And yes, it means teacher in Greek, but it denotes obedience. It denotes uh, authority. It says to the person, you are my master, I am your disciple, and I will follow you. When she confesses this, she is confessing that he is indeed her master. And it is joy where there was once despair. Jesus called her name. Just like he said before, like a shepherd calls the sheep and the sheep hear the voice. Here's the thing. You cannot make yourself see unless Jesus calls your name. What does that look like, though? What does that look like? I don't know. I don't know what that's going to look like for you personally, but it is going to be personal for you. Maybe you will hear an audible voice. I don't know. I've heard stories of Christians hearing an audible voice, and it brings them. They come alive to Jesus. Maybe it's going to be a huge, spectacular moment in your life. You know, you're walking along, smack down, you're hitting the floor. And you realize, whoa, through that, Jesus was calling your name. Maybe for you, it will be in the wee small hours of everyday life. You're in your car, driving along, and something on the radio, a word in the music, or something you're listening to, Maybe it's the audio Bible or another sermon or you're just looking at the sunset or the sunrise and you know. Mm. Or maybe it's today. Maybe it's right now as God opens his word and tells you that Jesus is not dead. He is alive. And through his word right now, he is calling your name. Come. Mary, 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 Mary. What do we do then? See, there's nothing we can do to open our own eyes. But when Jesus calls your name, oh man, respond. Don't reject him. Step into the life. Well, how, how, how do I get there, though? How, how do I get him to call my name? Well, this is the most amazing thing. For, first of all, what we need to do is stop trying to fit him into our own life. All right? So we gotta, that's the first thing, if you take anything from here. Stop trying to rationalize the Bible into your worldview. It's not going to work. Instead, just like the criminal on the cross, if you guys were here Friday... Who, who, who knew he was dead? What could he do? Pray harder? What could he do? Uh, read his Bible more? Give more? Do more acts of service? He's right there hanging with Jesus. What does he do? He, he, only thing he can. Jesus, remember me in your kingdom. Save me. Open my eyes. Break me out of my reality, out of my spiritual blindness. We pray and we ask, and we ask knowing that Jesus is the, the Savior who will listen and he will answer you. This is our hope. Why? Because he's not dead. Dead people don't speak. Jesus speaks because he's alive. Because he's alive. So pray and ask that he would call your name. And when he does, and you'll know, when he does, just step out into his light, into his reality, into his kingdom. And you know what the most amazing thing is going to happen? All right? You're going to look back in all the things you were blind to. The stone for Mary. The linen cloths for Mary. The angels, even Jesus himself. Oh my goodness, she surely would have just looked back and said, yes. And they would just fuel her joy. They would now make sense looking back after Jesus opened your eyes. 
and it would bring her joy. Yes, the stones roll away. That's why we celebrate, because he's alive. Yes, of course there's linen, because no linen cloth's going to stop our Savior. Yeah, of course I talk to angels. <laughs> she gets to say that, right? Of course, because they were proving this incredible day that Jesus is alive. Why are you crying? Why are you in despair? And she would remember, and she would remember, and she would praise God. It's the same thing for us. When Jesus opens your eyes, you're going to look back and you'll see. You will see with crystal clarity. Jesus is alive. And he brought me to life as well. Out of my blindness, into the sight. Out of my darkness, into the light. Out of my death, into his life. Why don't we pray about that? Father, this morning we celebrate Resurrection Sunday, knowing Jesus is alive. And Father, we want to, for, to ask forgiveness and apologize because so often we try to put your reality into our reality and it just doesn't work. We see the fact that we're trying and trying and trying to understand. We're trying to fit things over here. We're never going to do that. Thank you for showing that to us this morning. Father, I pray if there are people here right now who are feeling this desperation, wanting to believe that you would call their name, you would open their eyes, they would hear you, they would, they would respond realizing that they cannot do it on their own, but it's okay because you are a God who desires to bring people into the light, who desires to bring people to life, to break them out of their despair, to break them out of being stuck, out of their guilt, out of their sorrow, that is the type of God you are. And we know you can do that because you did what nobody else could. You defeated death by raising to life again. That is our joy. Father, I pray if there are people here who are not there, bring them into the joy. Bring them into it. Open their eyes. We pray this in your name. Amen. And amen. Hang around for some tea and some coffee and I can smell some hot cross buns in the oven at the back. Can anyone else smell them? Or? So now everyone's really hungry and wants to get to the tea, coffee and the hot cross buns. Thanks for coming and joining with us this morning. If there's someone here that you haven't seen before, then uh, just go and say hello. Introduce yourself and find out who they are. Come to your feet. Let's sing our last song. Lord, I'll lift your name high. Lord, I'll lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises I'm so glad you're in my life I'm so glad you came to save us You came from heaven to earth To show the way From the earth to the cross My debt to pay From the cross to the grave from the grave to the sky, Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My debt to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. Let's sing that again. Lord, I lift your name. Lord, I lift your name on high. 
Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My debt to pay from the cross to the grave. From the grave to the sky, Lord, I lift your name on. Sing it out, church. Here we go. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My debt to pay from the cross to the grave. From the grave to the sky, Lord, I lift your name on. You came from heaven to earth. To show the way from the earth to the cross, my dead way from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May He shine His face upon you. Go out and have it absolutely. Salubrious week and a fantastic Easter. And careful on how much chocolate you have. God bless.